Hi guys, and welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 429, featuring part four of my interview with the great Trent Oster, a veteran of Bioware and the founder of Beamdog. Uh, in this uh, slice, we're talking about Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition, the trials and tribulations, and what was going on. We get very technical about what was going on with the, uh, the enhanced uh, enhancement process with that, the graphics and the sprites and everything, characters and the palettes. Uh, we also talk about uh, Baldur's Gate 2, we talk about uh, Siege of Dragonspear, what went right, what went wrong there. Uh, and also Trent talks about his, his thoughts on Baldur's Gate 3 and uh, Larian doing that one. Uh, why not Beamdog? Uh, we also talk about Neverwinter Nights. Uh, again, what went right, what went wrong. Uh, a lot of fun behind the scenes information on that. Anyways, a lot of great material here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Trent Oster. Now here's another quote I thought was great, very much along these same lines. As they say, you got this joke you like to tell about programmers. You say, when a programmer believes he or she is being clever, that's when they create the greatest atrocities. <laughs> 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 and the Infinity Engine is chock full of clever. <laughs> and you're talking so there about the character rendering and how the, uh, the sprites... Nearly impossible to track down all the ways in which a simple sprite can be manipulated. I mean, <laughs> I, it sounds to me like this would this probably sounded like such a straightforward thing, you know, make an HD, make an enhanced edition. Sure, easy. I mean, it sounds like it's not that big of a deal, but the more I read stuff like this, it just like, whoa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this must well, have been a it, lot. It was a nightmare. A and we just, uh, we, we, it was such a nightmare. We just discovered each one. It was like every couple of days there was a fresh punch in the face. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, that's way worse than we thought it was. Oh, my God. So, like, Baldur's Gate characters, for an example, or, or first I'll, I'll deal with Baldur's Gate terrain tiles. So, a Baldur's Gate screen was a, a 5120 by 3480 screen. So, that was one image that was that big, and then you had this little window that was 64480 that could scroll around on it. So when we made the enhanced editions, we just increased the size of that. But that 640 by 480 region was actually a series of 64 by 64 tiles that were rendered. And the way they were rendered is each one of those tiles had its own 256 color palette. So it was stored as, a, as an 8-bit palletized image. And then the game engine would translate that into a 16-bit color by referencing into the palette, figuring out what it could do, and then bringing that into a 16-bit color. And so each of those little 64 by 64 tiles had its own separate little palette. So there's this whole palletization process where you took one big image and you cut it up in all these little tiles and each one got its palette. And then in real time, it would take that palette, translate to 16-bit, throw it up on the screen. So it's doing this every 64 by 64 tile. And so as a result, it's having to grab all these little pieces of 64 by 64 memory and move them around. And, and like Baldur's Gate at the era, it was like four megs to eight megs of RAM. So you couldn't hold that entire image in memory. You had to have all those little pieces. And as you were getting new pieces, it would be dumping the old pieces just so it could, could keep that space you were in in memory. When we started working on it, we're like, oh, my God, this is so complicated. So we actually wound up deleting all of that code and getting rid of it because it was in some ways it was like, OK, left shift, right two shift back this way. We called it Dogen point math. It was like fixed point You're using an integer processor to handle essentially a floating point concept. And you're pushing. It's, it's just an inelegant hack to do math mm -hmm. that's more complex than what you really want to be happening. So we, we got it down to the point where. When Enhanced Edition fires up, it grabs the 5120 by 3480 in 24-bit raw image, and boom, that's what we display. Just memory maps it as a file, and as you scroll around, you move around the, the terrain. And it, it, it's beautiful. Like One of the things with the Enhanced Edition that people don't notice is there's actually no load screen. When you fire up Baldur's Gate, there was a load screen on every area, and it was long enough for you to read that tooltip about three or four times. As you fire up the Enhanced Edition, you could just, it, you just boom, when you move from area to area, there's no load. It's just instantaneous. And the, the characters were equally complex, where they had 
a palette per every frame of animation. And then you had to take them and figure out the orientation. And then you had to figure out what cycle they were in. And it's this really complex, deep, essentially it's a, it's a probably like a four or five element deep array Mm -hmm. where you're referencing into this. Okay. I need this character with this combination of clothing and I need this orientation and I need this frame of this animation. So it's just referencing through these piles of data and then it's doing all this manipulation from palette to 16 bit graphic. Yeah. So we just went through and just deleted it all and essentially rewrote the whole system where it's like, and there's the 24 bit image we start with and there's the 24 bit image at the end and we don't do anything in between all that complex stuff. We just index the right stuff and display it. So having the extra horsepower, we were able to just cut so many corners and, and, the early Baldur's Gate stuff, those were clever, clever fixes that they had to do to Shock work around it. Clever, yeah. Oh, it's just, it was a ton of clever. And when you look at it and you're trying to figure it out after the fact, you're like, oh God, <laughs> it starts out here, then it gets transmogrified here, then it gets put here, then this, oh, then this gets mapped, and then, oh, whoa, whoa, there's like four versions of that path. How does, how does that work? It can go four separate ways here. How do, how do we make that? Oh God. It's just almost like you have to be some kind of archaeologist. And <laughs> it was part like, out, what were they doing? Why did they do this? And I think it was part like being a, a mortician and digging through yeah, this mortician. corpse. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> okay, something's really wrong here. This is, this is really bad. Okay, why did they do this? And then we had to go back. And then sometimes we'd actually call up people and ask them. It was like, so, so that whole palletization process, how was that done? And you're like, Oh, this guy wrote a tool, and we look at the math behind the tool, and the tool is horrible. <laughs> he literally it was like a first kick at, I'm going to generate an optimal palette for this. Okay, mm-hmm. just roughly crunch the numbers down, bit shift them, and puke them into a file. Well, I'm sure somebody was like... make those calls as folks are still around and everything. And I always think like 50 years from now, somebody doing this and... Oh, they're, they're going to be in a world of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they'll be good, though, because they'll be able to look at the original code. Then they'll look at our code, which is about a third the size, and they'll be like, okay, I get what they were doing here. Well, this next this next topic, I guess, is you know something that just still I, I, I kind of get emotional almost just thinking about this. And I can't imagine what it must have been like for you. Uh, but you're, you know, you're making this... The Baldur's Gate is supposed to be HD version, right? And then it says, After two days of searching, we came to the horrible realization that the source artwork was stored on a departmental drive and not a project drive and thus was not frequently backed up. We dug through tape backups to no avail. The source art was lost. Man, so we, what a... Uh, <laughs> so we I originally... Mean, yeah. I would have just, uh, I don't know how I would, just awful. The answer is we went through everything you did when you think about that. Because our original plan was we're going to take the game and we're going to go back to the original 3D Studio Max or, mm-hmm. or Lightwave art files. We'll re-render everything at four times the resolution and then we'll rebase and we'll rebuild the entire game around that. So we were expecting all these assets to just be there. And then we got the asset dump from Bioware and we're like, okay, okay, going through everything. And we had a ton of different files. Like we had probably 14 versions of the code. We had dumps from different people's computers. We had the naming scheme didn't make sense in some ways. There was like a source and a destination and and source wasn't really source. Source was kind of a uh, almost like a mid-step in the data being generated from the raw source. So it was just confusing. And finally, we're digging through it and we're like, there's absolutely no art files here for, for environments. There's no art files here for characters. Where are they? And, and I actually went over to the Bioware offices and I sat down with their IT team. And I went through everything that was on the network. And, and I, I dug as deep as I possibly could. Guys sitting right there beside me helping me ferret out hidden locations and everything. And it turned out that the art drive just was not backed up. How's that even possible? I think in those days, it was uh, it was the job of the IT department to make sure that backups were performed. And when you informed them about specific drives, they backed them up. And I think if they thought that a drive wasn't that important, 
they wouldn't they either wouldn't back it up or they would back it up much less frequently and potentially reuse those tapes for other backups later so i think the general rule was if nobody asked for a backup after a couple of years you'd consider the tape done and you'd roll it back in and, and use it again hmm. and uh, i assume the art was just lost in that way but we went through the whole stages of grief <laughs> it was like oh god it's all dead we're never going to be able to do it yeah, and then just... days later we're like well what if we came at it and we created the enhanced edition mm -hmm. where we we work from the art that's on the disc so we work from what's what's there in the final ship product and we just reverse engineer it and we build it back up and and do the best we possibly can and partway through our searches, we found actual 24-bit raw versions of the area files themselves before they were cut up, before they were palletized. So we were able to make that artwork look better. But the character stuff, we just had what we had to work with. So we went through every rendering idea, every shader idea we could to, to make it look better. HQ2X upsampling, doing a black kind of outline around them. We twiddled with all these features. We'd ship one version, the fans would say, it looks horrible, we hate you guys. We'd make it into an option and we'd dial it down a bit. Fans. And we'd ship another version and they're like, this isn't at all like I remember. And we're like, okay, okay, we'll make it an option. And we just kept trying to make the best version of what was there possible. And I think in the end we, re we arrived with a a good solution, but not a perfect solution. And uh, at this point, I mean, short of recreating all the artwork from absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. I don't think there is a perfect solution. You know, what would you do if somebody tomorrow was like, hey, I found this old hard drive and everything's here? I'd punch them in the <laughs> gut. <laughs> That's stick it in the shoebox or the closet, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'd punch them in the gut and then I'd, uh, I'd pull it out and I'd start looking at it. And uh, I think enough years have passed, it would be hard to get everything functioning again so you could render it. But, I mean, if you're willing to grind, grind through the salt mines, you can probably eventually start getting stuff to, to render out and, and look even better. Yeah, I liked your quote here about the what you learned from this experience. So the key learning here is don't panic, always have a towel. <laughs> because you, that's your, yeah, because you never know when you're going to be surprised. Towels can be very, very useful. So yeah, I mean, I guess it. You know, there's the, that's a good lesson to take from this. <laughs> I, hope, I hope everybody gets the reference. If not, you, know, you should go read Hitchhiker's Guide. <laughs> it's Hitchhiker's Guide, and the other thing is that you can dry a lot of tears with a towel. Oh. <laughs> a lot of tears. Works for sweat too. So I guess about the only other thing here about uh, Baldur's Gate, we sort of touched on most of this already. Now I did think the I do love the uh, the tablet, uh, the tablet space or tablet version. You know, I always kind of think even when I go back and play it on my PC now, sometimes you're just like, I wish I could just touch that. <laughs> I find myself doing that where I'll play it on yeah. tablet for a while. I'll go to a PC and I'll be I'll be touching the screen on my PC and I'm like, oh yeah. Different, different, doesn't work like that. Do you feel like if you've got a lot of new people playing that didn't play it back in the day and just see it in the, uh, play it on iOS for the first time, basically? I think so. I think, I think there's kind of a mix. There's this nostalgia mix who are like, yeah, Baldur's Gate, I remember that. I had a lot of fun with that. And the idea that you can just play it on your couch while, while somebody's watching TV and, and just hang out with other people. I think that's really powerful. And then I think there's a lot of people who they see these like top 20 RPGs of all time. And what's this Baldur's Gate thing? Oh, I can buy it on an iPad. Hey, awesome. I'll play it on an iPad. I mean, the downside, the game's not very accessible. Like you jump into Baldur's Gate, you kind of walk around Candlekeep. Okay, I think I got the basics of the game. Uh, there's the grind cutscene. Then you go out into the wilderness and you are killed by a wolf. Or a bear, depending on which direction you walk. Oh. And there's there's nothing you can this do about game that. Sucks. It's the, it's the harshness of the rules as we implemented them. And uh, whoever put that wolf in there just they should have made it. Originally, a little further down the path, you run into these gibberlings, and uh, they were they were too powerful early on. We actually had to make them diseased gibberlings so that the, the <laughs> first level party stood a chance against I'm them. I'm pretty sure they still killed me a few times. <laughs> Probably. It is a merciless game, but once you get past that first little bit, I mean, for me, the magic starts to happen when you get into the Nashville mines. That's really where it gets amazing. 
And by the time you hit the bottom of the Nashville mines, you're like, I'm really liking this. Yeah. Just remember there's a, like an end somewhere. It's first part of the game and a wizard comes down to kill you. Friendly or moon. God, I think I'd ever uh, get past that. I mean, every uh, time I play the game, I get stuck there forever trying to get past well, this dude. And the wizard's a total jerk because he, he uses <laughs> he a spell that. <laughs> yeah, well, he uses a spell on you that basically mentally scrambles half your party. So everybody's yeah. wandering around, not be, not really doing anything. And he's just murdering your, your key party members. And then he gets you and it's over. So we uh, we definitely had a lot of discussions about that. And it's like, hey, what if we went in and we nerfed the hell out of him? And then we're like, well, you know, then it's not really Baldur's Gate anymore. So we, we really got into this whole, yeah, yeah, are, but... are we, are we curators in a museum? Are we, are we keeping what it was or are we remaking it to make it better? And I think the line we settled on was we're curating it. We're going to make the technology better. We're going to remove the technical obstacles, but we're going to keep that gameplay as people remember it. And, uh, with all of its harsh and punishing edges. I think that was definitely the right call. It uh... felt right. Once we settled in on it, we're like, yeah, let's let's make let's let's not change what the game is. Let's keep it what it is. I like the idea of are we curators or are we Yeah, are are we reimagining this or are we curating it? And the answer It's not Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. I want to talk a little bit about Siege of the Dragon Spear. You know, I've been showing off my uh, uh collector's edition here. I guess it's been a couple of years. It seemed like yesterday, but you know, what are your thoughts on the, on the whole Siege of Dragon Spear project? Well, Siege of Dragon Spear started out with a pretty limited scope, and it just kept kind of growing and growing and growing and growing. And then we played it through, and it really felt there was some good bits at the beginning, there were some good bits at the end, but the middle felt a little too narrow, so we added a bunch of content. And I mean, for the size of the studio at the time and the effort we put into it, we probably overreached pretty hard. In the end, I think there's some really great content in there. I think there's some moments where the hair stood up in the back of my neck when I was playing it. Like there's a spot where you meet who you later discover is John Arenicus, and and he he's actually references actions you've made in the adventure. So if if you if you take one path, he references one specific thing you've done. But if you take a different path on it, he'll actually make a different reference to it. And just having that voice david warner speaking to you and referencing what you did in the game just a really cool moment to me and then we also pushed it in some technical ways where we had literally an entire army coming down the bridge fighting it was a lot of fun yeah i almost feel like i'm baldur's gate just seems like such a high watermark i guess for role playing as it almost will be a little intimidating and you know, you, you probably heard about the, well, I'm sure you had, like this this new Bard's Tale that, who's that working on? Uh, Larian Studios is working on. And almost wonder, like, man, that is such a mountain. <laughs> yeah, well, th <laughs> that's kind of the challenge. How can you possibly uh, live up to yeah. that? To make Baldur's Gate 3 after Baldur's Gate 2, which Baldur's Gate 2 was that, that team that made Baldur's Gate 1 mm -hmm. really mastering their craft. Baldur's Gate 1 was about, hey, this is our first game. We just got the tools working. We put everything together. We fixed all the bugs we could find, and here's our first game. And then Baldur's Gate 2 was, okay, based on everything we now know, since we actually know how to make a game now, we know how to ship it, let's make something awesome. And, and like Baldur's Gate 2 is it's, it's a roller coaster through some of the best settings in the Forgotten Realms. You go through Sahagan City, the, the Underdark, a Drow City. There's just amazing locations. You're, you're meeting Gith Yankee. You're talking about special silver swords. There's, it's just hitting on so many, so many beautiful areas, and that is intimidating. Trying to follow that up because yeah. nobody's going to remember the graphics of 2000, 2002. They're going to be thinking about the graphics in their mind. They're like 2019 Baldur's Gate three. Man, what is this going to look like? This is going to be the most amazing thing ever. I mean, we would have loved to have done it. Um, I think Larian's a, a really great choice to do it. The Divinity Original Sin, they've, they've got really good technology. They've obviously proven they can do a really pretty looking game. And uh, I think they'll do a really competent job. But, man, they got uh, they got some work in front of them. Yeah, I was wondering. It seemed like they would have come to you to, to, to do it. I, I think it was one of those things where to do a Baldur's Gate 3 is a really big undertaking. 
And we just were never in a financial position where we could actually take that monster of a job on and actually be confident we could pull it off at the level we wanted to do it. Sometimes it, it comes down to how many zeros are in the bank account, and sometimes there's not enough. Hmm. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what, what Larian does. They'll do something fun. I think I think there will be people who, who really appreciate what they build, and I think there'll be detractors who are, who are this isn't the Baldur's Gate 3 they imagined, and, and you know what? That's okay. Hopefully it's not like the Phantom Menace of... <laughs> <laughs> you know... That's kind of what I, I feel like. It's almost like Baldur's Gate 2 to me. It's kind of like the Empire Strikes Back. and You know, maybe I, I would settle for a Return of the Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could definitely see yeah, that. Yeah, if you would that. But I hope it's, you know, lives up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Neverwinter Never Winter Nights. You know, this is a favorite game. I've been covering these games. I've kind of been on this Neverwinter Nights binge now for a while on Matt Chat. I played the first one. And, uh did the Neverwinter Nights 2 and Mask of the Betrayer. And, you know, that's another one. I don't think, you know, now that these enhanced editions are, are out, people are kind of going back and realizing, hey, this was great stuff. We had a, you know, a really good time with these. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this, because I know you probably had even more to do with Neverwinter Nights than uh, with Baldur's Gate, right? Yeah, so on the Baldur's Gate side, um, for Baldur's Gate 1, I was the 3D art department head for a period, and then at the end I came back and ran a multiplayer testing rig with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had actually pulled some of the artists from Neverwinter Nights to help finish it. Same with Baldur's Gate 2. We had pulled over some assets, uh, some resources to help finish it. But Neverwinter really was my baby. I, I sat down with literally a sentence of, it's going to be everything that D&D &D is in the box. That's what we're going to build. Everything that D&D &D is in the box. Yeah. And, and You don't lack for ambition. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> I think my career can be best summarized by... by stumbling into something and saying how hard could it possibly be and the answer is always oh god it is so hard <laughs> but just being too stubborn to actually admit that it's that hard and just seeing it through like to me when people look at bioware and they're like man this company was so amazing so successful at its time it was we didn't cancel projects we saw them through and we were ambitious as hell and uh, and we were optimists we were always optimistic it was never it was never about defeat it was always about Okay, this isn't working this way. Let's just let's just change slightly. Let's let's keep going. Let's solve this. And with Neverwinter Nights, I really I really looked at Baldur's Gate as something you consumed like a reading a novel. It's like there's a story, you're playing your part in the story, but you're on a very very tight rail to what exactly is happening. Whereas I imagined Neverwinter Nights to be much more like a D&D &D session where you're going on this planned adventure and then suddenly Bob decides he's going to start a fight in the tavern and it all goes sideways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and eventually you stumble back onto the main path, oh, but you Bob. have this, I think we all know a Bob, <laughs> <laughs> but you have a, you have a fun time. Bob took you in an unplanned direction. Maybe you get some interesting loot. Maybe you wind up running out of the town. And I really enjoyed kind of the spontaneity of, of pen and paper D and D and, and how that went. And I, I really liked the idea of the party all being kind of on an equal standing, whereas Baldur's Gate, it's the story of the chosen one and his companions. So you're either the chosen one or you're you're there as as a participant. So I really wanted to push Neverwinter into that party focused multiplayer play it together experience. And I mean in some ways I think we really hit on it and in other ways I think there's there's problems that popped up that I I'd, I'd never imagined. Like one of them was kind of the loot race where you go into a dungeon with a party and you start fighting a creature, and rather than helping you out, one of your party members runs past you to fight the next one so they can get the loot from that monster. So you're like, help, help me, because the monsters are tougher. That's probably because, Bob. Yeah, probably Bob. <laughs> the, the monsters get tougher based on the challenge rating of the party. So if there's like six of you together and you're all reasonably high level, you're going to get monsters that will challenge you. But if you're left alone fighting one of them, you might get wiped out. I have a question from Philippe Pepe, and he had sent me this link. I tried to follow up, but I, don't, I didn't have time for him to follow up. But he sent me this big document. I guess it was uh, <laughs> the Source Stone original campaign. I don't know if you've seen okay. it. It looks like it's some notes from some early draft of uh, everyone a nice original campaign. And he's asking about some of the ideas 
I asked him about the ideas behind the original Neverwinter Nights campaign. And I was, it's the first time I'd seen this document, but they were talking in there about a madness mechanic. Sounds something similar to like a spirit eater type situation. A uh, bunch of stuff about lizard men. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know what all else he's uh, asking about there, but I assume that the original, there must have been several uh, versions of the plot and story. There were a lot of versions. So I actually have the original design doc that we put together mm -hmm. and used to pitch the game. And it, it basically had kind of five major chapters in the story. And the, the big bad at the end was uh, was kind of a, an ancient lizard creator, creator race, which is it's not explicitly dealt with in the Forgotten Realms lore, but it's always referenced. So it's something that we thought was a lot of fun and, and it would be a lot of fun to play with. Um, we had in... The original concept had this this idea of were these magical twins that were co-joined twins who basically they kind of fed off each other. It was essentially two mages in one body and they were radically different in their powers and their approach. And then at, at some point they start to get magically twisted. And, and that's kind of where that madness mechanic comes in. And uh, I think we had these brilliant story things we wanted to do. And then we parked it, and then we, we slogged through four year, like probably four years of just developing the technology and getting everything up and running again. And we came back to the story, and we're like, we can't do half of what we wanted to do. Okay, what can we do? Okay, what works? Like, we originally had this idea that, okay, you're going to jump into this huge area. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be massive. And then we found out, okay, Neverwinter can't do that. It can do different areas and the areas can be active in parallel, but we're going to have to segment things up a lot more than we originally anticipated. And then we came up with this concept of having essentially like an adventuring hub. And then from the hub, there's almost modules around it. And uh, ultimately it came down to there's what we want to build and there's what we can build. So let's build what we can build. And uh, the story was neglected a lot in the original Neverwinter, just getting the tools and the platform and all of the performance and everything up. And the, the campaign kind of came in really hot. We tested it. We found most of the bugs, but at the same time, it wasn't kind of a masterwork. We always we always measured ourselves against Baldur's Gate 2. Mm -hmm. So when we made Neverwinter Nights, we're like, the fans are going to want a ton of creatures. They're going to want monsters that they can make their own adventures with. We can't do like Baldur's Gate 1. We got to do Baldur's Gate 2. But Baldur's Gate 2 was Baldur's Gate 1 monsters plus all the monsters they built for Baldur's Gate 2. So we set ourselves this really high bar and... Uh, it was a real challenge. And then we did uh, the Shadows of Undertide expansion with Floodgate. Since that was kind of partially external, we really couldn't hone our craft and polish it up to the same kind of level. Whereas I think with Hordes of the Underdark, you kind of saw that Baldur's Gate 2 level. Yeah, Hordes of the Underdark. We, that's the... Yeah. We've really kind of hit the mastery. Yeah. We figured out how to do our craft and how to do it well. I think I've got it somewhere. Well, i got the Platinum. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm pretty sure that has it in there. Yep, Platinum's got it in there. There's there were so many versions. Atari was so good at it, it's like, Platinum. we're going to create a new version, and I would hear, hear about a new one, and there was like this one and that one, and, and then there was discussions of like a Ruby version, and uh, it got it got nuts for a while there. This one's pretty slick. I, know, I guess, did they ever do a big box version of uh, Hordes? I don't think they ever did. I think, uh, I think it was just rolled in straight into the into the the platinum versions later. I guess they could be like comic books and have like 17 different covers for, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. The comics have gotten even more like in the, all these different cover variations and everything and games. Meanwhile, they're, they're, you're lucky to even get a box copy. Yeah. I, I think games are still, which we're, we're kind of caught between the, the mechanics on, they cost so much to make. We have to sell so many copies in parallel. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the comics being less expensive, you can really kind of focus in and say, this is what our kind of our core fans like. And we can provide multiple versions of this so that that core fan can engage deeper with the comic. They can buy four or five alternate covers. Whereas in a video game, you're like, Oh God, we got to sell 150,000 or, or 5 million copies to break even. So mm -hmm. let's focus on the breadth not on the on the narrow segment and, and providing that. And I think you're starting to see the emergence of that with kind of the ultimate collector editions and, and stuff like that, where it's that chance to buy that, that super special version of it. So we'll get there eventually. I don't know if everybody will embrace it. 
it'll be a, a, a mixed bag, I think. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back uh, soon with the fifth and final part of this interview. Got a lot of material coming up. Actually got a... I thought this was going to be the final episode, but then I realized I had like maybe 30 to 40 more minutes. Uh, so I think it's definitely worth having another episode with Trent. Uh, also, I'm lining up an interview with uh, uh, George uh, Zietz, or Zietz, I think it's Z- uh, Zietz. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, George will be coming on. Uh, I'll be interviewing him next week. Uh, so if you have a question for George, uh, please let me know. I'd be happy to uh, ask him those, uh, assuming we have time. Uh, you know, he's a big... Uh, Neverwinter Nights uh, persona as well, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, as always, I want to thank you uh, very, 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 very much for your support uh, of this show. It really means a lot to me. Uh, you just don't know how much I appreciate <laughs> the, the level of gratitude is fully maxed out here. <laughs> uh, I just really, I really appreciate your support. I need your support to keep these episodes coming. Uh, so if you like Matt Chat, you like what I'm doing here, you like these interviews, uh, just hop on over to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. You know, a buck an episode, uh, you might get charged, oh, I don't know, three or four bucks a month maybe. Uh, of course, if you want to put in some more, two, two dollars, five bucks, uh, some people even go 25 uh, bucks. Uh, you know, whatever it is that you are comfortable contributing and the show's worth to you, uh, I appreciate that and thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, what about the news from the Mad Cave? <laughs> All right, got some awesome stuff here from uh, uh, various sources. Uh, one is. Uh, Jim Ward, he's a, I guess he's a figure on, over at a, a TSR uh, back in the day, D&D, Dungeons and Dragons company, uh, before they were bought out by uh, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, anyway, he's got a little post up where he talks about uh, how TSR, why they ended up going with SSI to do their lovely gold box games. Uh, he talks a little bit about the meeting with Electronic Arts. Was it Joe uh, Ibarra? Uh, that he uh, was talking to over there. It was, it's just a lot of fun behind-the-scenes stuff about this. You know, I wish it had come out before I did my <coughs> Dungeons and Desktops book. Love to have included his uh, stories. Uh, he also talks in there about why uh, uh, SSI ended up dropping, uh, or why TSR ended up dropping SSI. It was not with uh, Jim Ward's approval. He actually was kind of upset about it. Uh, anyway, I post a link to this in the show notes. It's not a long uh, piece, but I think you'll really, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, you'll want to read this for sure. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, the website while you're there, that is the Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk page or talk forums. Uh, anyway, this is a podcast. I didn't know much about it, but a uh, good old Shane Stacks uh, lined up an interview. Apparently, he's a guest host there sometimes. He's a guest host for this episode. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm on there this time, episode number 69. <laughs> wow, 69, dude! Uh, we're on that episode with Shane and Morris talking about, of course, uh, Dungeons and Desktop 2nd Edition. And uh, by the way, if you haven't gotten that book, uh, you know, what the heck? <laughs> you're going to love it. Just hop on to Amazon, uh, grab that thing immediately. You're going to uh, really, if you like RPGs, CRPGs at all, I guarantee you're going to like that book. Uh, and also, if you have the book, <clears throat> you know, please, please go to um, I go to Amazon, write a review. Even if it's just two words, good book, <laughs> like the book, you know, anything is, is fine. Uh, but every one of those reviews bumps it up in the uh, search results. So it uh, really, really helps a lot. So, you know, if, uh, if you want to help the show, that's a good way to do it. All right, a couple other items here. My old friend Matt Bradley Shergi, old Matt Shergi. Uh, he's written a book about none other than you, Bowl. <laughs> now, why you would want to write a book about this gentleman is beyond me, but it's called The Films of You, Bowl, Volume 1. Apparently, this is a planned series. Uh, the subtitle is The Video Game Movies, 2003 to 2014. Uh, so, if, I know, I guess you, Bowl, those movies, a lot of people consider those, uh, like, so bad they're good, I guess would be kind of a fair way to put that. Uh, it's not something, uh, 
you know, maybe I should give them another chance. I might, I might like them nowadays. I was not, I remember watching a few of those way back, I guess, well, 2003 or so, and not being very impressed, but, uh, you know, it's still around. I can think I heard some somebody tell me one time he's got some kind of tax write-offs. <laughs> he's like doing this as some kind of tax scheme, these, these terrible movies. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you want to read all about it, Matt Shergi has the book for you. Uh, but he wrote me about a game he's working on. So he's actually working with you bowl on an RPG game. And he says it's based on what was a, a script that was going to be Postal 2. It's a political satire and humor meets console style 16-bit RPG. So he's using RPG Game Maker uh, for that project. Uh, anyway, he's got a podcast link that he sent me, Game Dev Breakdown. So he, he's wanted to come on the show to talk about this, but uh, <laughs> you know, I thought I'd let you guys uh, know about it. Look at the podcast, uh, listen to the podcast if you want, Matt on, and I'm sure we can uh, do that. I actually was thinking it might be fun to do a Google Hangout, uh, another one of these. Uh, uh, sort of Matt Chat Hangouts and have Matt on. Because uh, I think you guys probably know more about you, Bowl, <laughs> and have uh, thoughts to share with him. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, last bit of news. I don't know if you've been keeping up with this whole Blizzard thing. I mean, it's just a real... I don't I don't like to, you know, get into pol politics on this show. I can't stand politics, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's like talking about religion uh, for me. I just avoid it. Uh, but anyway, this does concern Blizzard. So basically what happened, if my understanding is, uh, they're doing some kind of esports thing with, uh, I think it was Hearthstone, and the champion, I guess, yelled out something about the Hong Kong situation, Liberate Hong Kong. It says his player's name is uh, Blitzchung, or Wai Chung, I guess is his name. Uh, so I guess the, the Chinese government was upset about this. Apparently they have, you know, just got, this is sort of what I've heard, they... Uh, basically control a lot of Blizzard or they have some sway with Blizzard. So they got a Blizzard to uh, take the guy's prize money away from him, uh, which that doesn't seem right. Uh, but anyway, the news item is that Blizzard has decided to reverse this and go ahead and give the guy his money. Uh, so they're restoring his prize money. And they also stated that, quote, our relationships in China had no influence on our decision. Right, uh, and that if a player had shouted a pro Beijing slogan, they would also be dealt with the same way. <laughs> I don't know, what a mess. Huh? A lot of people trying to boycott, you know, Blizzard, whatever. You know, I see some, uh, some they had a, in this article that I'm, I'll link to, they had some uh, quotes from some of these other game companies, and I think Riot said that they would, uh, they don't tolerate any kind of politi political views. I forget the name of the other company, but one of them was saying, they would just let you say anything you wanted, you know, <laughs> be fine. So uh, I don't know what you all think about all this, you know, but anyway, I'd like to get your take on it. Uh, what do you think? <clears throat> do you think Blizzard made the right decision <laughs> to restore the prize money? <laughs> uh, anyway, let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. Uh, so I was looking for quotes about ambition because it came up in this interview and I found a lot of them. But I really like this one, it's by uh, the artist Salvador Dali. It goes something like this. Intelligence without ambition is a bird without wings. Ponder on that and see you guys next time. Only happen in the movies, Robin. This is real life. <laughs>